Well, hi, everyone. It's so great to see you all. Um, my name is Molly Todd, and I'm the treasurer for CCC. And I'm going to get us started today. Um, we're very exciting to be hosting Lily Ye today um, for her talk on creating art and community building. Um, and in case any of you are unfamiliar with the Community Change Collaborative, um, I just wanted to say quickly a few words about who we are, and then we'll pass it over to you, Lily Ye. Um, so CCC is a graduate student organization under the supervision of doc Dr. Stevenson, who's our faculty advisor. Um, and we look at forces shaping community, um, different approaches to community engagement, and how to build sustainable cross-sectoral partnerships. And we're an interdisciplinary group, and we're always seeking to connect theory into practice, praxis and build community. So if you're interested in knowing more about CCC, please reach out to myself um, or Dr. Stevenson or Netta, who is also on this meeting, and we're happy to tell you more. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Lily Ye. Um, so Lily Ye is an internationally celebrated artist whose work has taken her to communities throughout the world. As founder and executive director of the Village of Art and Humanities in North Philadelphia from 86 to 04, she helped create a national model of community building through the arts. In 2002, Ye founded Barefoot Artists, Inc., an organization that brings the transformative power of art to impoverished communities around the globe through participatory multifaceted projects that foster community empowerment, improve the physical environment, promote economic development, and preserve indigenous art and culture. In addition, in addition to the United States, she has carried out projects in multiple countries, including Kenya, Ivory Coast, Ghana, Rwanda, China, Taiwan, Ecuador, Syria, Republic of Georgia, Haiti, Palestine, and South Sudan. And if you didn't have a chance to take a look um, in our CCC email, we did send a link to her documentary film, The Barefoot Artist, which delves into her life and work. Um, so without me talking anymore, uh, Lily Ye, we are very excited to hear from you. Hi, everybody. Thank you uh, for giving me the time and the opportunity to explain um, what I do. Uh, so I think because I'm a visual artist, so the best way to tell my story is just through slides, presentation. Mm. So um, I um, actually was um, trained, my background is actually in Chinese landscape uh, painting. And that's my great love. And that's when I fell in love with, um, with the painting. And uh, all my life, I think I long for that special place I encountered in Chinese landscape painting. The, the, um, the scholars would call it the dustless world. It is pristine, beautiful, ba balanced, poignant, and powerful. And so when I came here, I went to University of Pennsylvania, Graduate School of Fine Arts, and I came during the 60s. I mean, imagine the shock I un encountered from that pristine, traditional, um, hundred thousand years old tradition suddenly thrust into the 20th century during the 60s, and when all is possible and anything is allowed. So I was totally um, uh, uh, un uh, unseated and uh, and confused. But anyway, I managed. After I graduated from school, eventually I began teaching at the University of the Arts and I taught there almost for 30 years. But it was during my teaching, in the midst, in the middle of my teaching um, career, I felt something was missing. And that's really what, how I began the journey of trying to find back 
the place that I long for and uh, and what it, does it mean for a Chinese woman to be an authentic self and not losing her culture and be relevant in the contemporary um, society and am able to make a contribution. That's what started me on this big journey. And so from a studio artist, I eventually, um, I was invited by, uh, by um, this wonderful artist called Arthur Hall. And I don't think um, we know of his name. He has tremendous talent. And the one of the first one uh, generation in introducing Western African art to, um, to um, inner city youth. And that's where his center so that they can begin to find their roots and have a sense of dignity. Arthur Hall, who invited the late Arthur Hall, who invited me to do a humble little uh, project on an abandoned lot next to his building. And that was in 1986. And as you can see, his building is already in a very bad situation. And the, the, the big lot you see was after um, I got a tiny little grant from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. That was only, at the beginning, only one little lot. And I, um, I have no idea how to do it, but since everybody is get, uh, writing for a grant, I said, well, why not? Um, so I wrote and I didn't think anybody would take me seriously. And when the little bit of money, $2,500 came, and that's when I got really frightened. And I said, well, this is for real. What do I do now? And at that time, city leveled the 10 houses um, uh, adjacent to the abandoned lot. And so I have this huge lot. And so I went and asked expert and they say, well, you can't do this. You're a woman um, from the outside and people won't accept you. And kids are going to destroy everything you built. And you have a drop in the bucket. You can't do anything. And we and recommend me to write a feasibility study and forget about the project. And I said, wow, that makes sense since I had no idea um, what to do. Just as I was writing the letter, my inner voice spoke to me and he said, you have been looking for an opportunity. You have been looking for authenticity. You have been looking for, and um, if you cannot rise to the occasion, the best of you will die and the rest will not amount to anything. That really scared me. And I said, well, um, even if I didn't know how, but at least I can do something with the children. And that's how I mustered enough courage and I went in. And I mean, nothing prepared me for this situation. So finally, one day I was looking around and I find the stick and I drew a big circle and I put the stick in the center. And I said, from here, we're going to build. And I, um, nobody, I couldn't get any adults except one person who is in um, baseball ca cap. And he didn't have a job. The, the, the words on the street is that there was, uh, there's this crazy Chinese woman looking for him. So he didn't want to have anything to do with me. So the third time I visited him, he was too slow. So I shared with him, uh, to build a, par a little park since he lived in an abandoned home next to the park. And then, so this sounded good. He didn't have a job. So he decided to help me. And uh, so the, no, I had no money to, to, get, to hire adults and nobody would come. Who would come? This crazy woman. And so, but the kids came by thrones. Every day they came. So we start digging and we start um, uh, find the bricks and so forth. We lined it up and made it into, um, okay, oh, right. And this place is so 
uh, dry. I said, we need something growing. And we didn't have money to buy trees. So I said, well, maybe we can make trees by a lath wire and whatnot. And what you saw earlier, this is my um, first team from three and a half to 13. That's my first crew. Children was so excited. Yama on the right, three and a half. And he brought his toy truck to help us build. And so we made the cement, we recycled the Belgian block, and sometimes street person would come by. And this, and then were we successful? No. But I, the, the summer went, I mean, the next summer I, I came back, but the paint started to peel off like got, getting some kind of skin disease. Everybody was laughing their teeth off our project. And the words on the street was that um, a woman and a bunch of children, they, they, they don't know what they were doing. Of course, I was hurt, but they were right on the target. Do, uh, we didn't know what we were doing. Our head didn't know what we were doing, but our heart knew, especially children. They sense something vital they can participate. So that's when we learned. I, I learned um, a mosaic by my wonderful friend Isaiah. Maybe many people know him, the master mosaic master Isaiah Zagar. So we, we went and did the, um, did the mosaic. Uh, yeah, right. You saw the first one. Um, it's the third time. Finally, I figured it out. And then I brought, I painted this painting. And then during the start, I knew, I sensed the power of art can transform space. During the process of painting, not only adults begin to, to, uh, to um, drift in, wanting to take part. We got words from th 17th floor uh, projects. They like what we were doing. They were sending uh, words out, girl, go faster. We like what you were doing. So I sense that art has the power to bring people together. And the kids uh, who were might destroy our, uh, our work, became the protector, became the guardian angel of our work. And forever, Jojo, Joseph Williams, uh, is forever in my heart. He was the first person who stepped in, who helped me, who organized the children. And that's how the project took roots in the community. And so I was teaching at the University of the Arts and jo the rest of the time Jojo became, Jojo and the children became the guardian of this abandoned lot. And the city tore out more houses. Um, so I said, well, what to do in this, uh, 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 on this abandoned uh, alley? And I said, we, we need our communities is in such distress and we need comfort. What's better than bring in the presence of the angels to bring uh, to comfort our, uh, our, our community. And I figured that since uh, this is African American, um, African American community and that's bring African angels. And I happen to have a book on Ethiopian angels. So I enlarged the eight inches tall angels into eight foot tall angels. And you see big man, he's huge, 300 pounds and so. And he um, was 20 year, he fell into the uh, wrong trap and began using drug and selling drug for 20 years. Not only he helped to, to, to destroy the community, he destroyed his own body. He had no place to go and he thought that one day he is going to die um, uh, uh, die at the, gutter, uh, at the gutter of the street. He came to Jojo for refuge and he was suffering so much pain and, uh, um, and he never had art. But I needed help. From the beginning, I needed help and children can help me. Jojo can help me. Now I 
um, I need to help someone to make mosaics. He has all the time in the world. So he began, we began to work together. I guided him and, and piece by piece, he began to put his life together. And he was suffering so much pain. Every three hours, he has to soak his feet in ice water so he can bear the pain. And, uh, but it is the making of the angel that get him, um, that give him the strength to get up every morning. And so here is our angel with broken pieces that people gave us of the tiles. And then we are all broken in, the, in, this, uh, in this broken community. And yet with imagination and action, we're able to create a wonderful mural. We call it angel mural. It doesn't belong to any uh, religion. It doesn't divide us, but its presence protect comfort of our community. So this is time you um, you break down barrier of religion and race and uh, expertise or whatever, and we work together. Because they saw, community saw that children were having such a good time. Their laughter bring rippling joy into the community, adults began to drift in. And there was plenty of abandoned lot. And so um, six months into the work and um, a reporter came. And then I realized that all my, um, all my uh, crew members were on drug, everyone. Okay, and so people start to tell us, and even within the organization, and they say, you cannot work with the, this group of two, uh, people, they're drug addicts. Then I say, they were the only one who would come and help me. Without them, no work is, was possible. More than that, I said, let's not focus on what, where we failed, and let's see how we can work together. Big man now became the foreman. Every week, three times a week, he organized narcotic anonymous meeting. He brings the people who st were struggling on their lifeline together and trying to survive. And he monitored the drug problem of our team. But look, what the, this is before the abandoned law. This is after, I think with low budget, low budget, low skill. It's only possible in inner city, North Philadelphia. We, I call it the meditation park. I didn't have wealth. I didn't have, I don't have um, much expertise, but I brought what inspired me to this project, Chinese gardens, Islamic courtyard. And we, because we work together, we became more powerful. We took on rebuilding houses. And now this is, we re And this is the first tree of life. Our community do not get the opportunity to travel a lot abroad. We brought world culture to here. Obviously, this is from a Persian Islamic uh, tree of life. And I designed it and big man, um, yeah, big man. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, right, I see, you're right. Um, so this is another abandoned lot with imagination and we transform another park. All things beautiful were completely open to community, but we protected with what uh, we protected. Next. Yes, we protected with beauty. African wood sculpture became our guardian angel. Yes and even spaceship and uh, came onto our another abandoned lot two acre or so and highly polluted and so we turned it into a tree park and to nurture 
this depleted land and the depleted community. So we have volunteers, we have city years, we have, yeah, okay. And then we have experts helping us, we have a ceremony. And then in the tree park, we have a tree nursery and we began to nurture tiny little business, 15,000 tree seedlings. And we do that uh, for the city. And so I would, without sculpture, it will not be uh, our project. And so we populate this tree, um, uh, tree, um, yeah, uh, with, uh, with um, wild animals. So with the high tree, uh, with the high uh, um, uh, grasses, it transformed um, the bleakness into something just soothing, wonderful. And so through art, through working together, through honoring the community culture, we are able to transform uh, abandonment into the land, the bad land, into the land of enchantment. And the, the, the world, the society often tell us, well, um, you're poor, you live in where, uh, you're colored, you're women, and uh, you don't, you don't, uh, you didn't go to work for the school, so you don't count. And I said, we refuse to accept the prejudice of the others. And then let's define ourselves. So we create an art and a harvest festival. And we look at ourselves, we bedeck ourselves with imagination and beauty. And then we find ourselves creative, desirable, full of talent and delight. We build a pup, puppet two story high and with, with fanfare and color. We would march down our tiny little streets and we will bless, we will knock on every door and our children hold the gift basket, a, a, a basket of gift. And we all say together, may the good spirit bless this neighborhood, may the good spirit bless this household and may the good spirit bless all the children. And the child would offer a gift and uh, of goodwill and so our festival gets more and more elaborate. And I think one year, Mayor, uh, then Mayor Randell came with us, bless the abandoned lot, bless the abandoned houses, and may all that be transformed. And look at our uh, offering um, gifts. Uh, and so the high point, the pivot of the, uh, the festival is the rites of passage. I felt that the most vulnerable population were the children who are, uh, who are graduating from our program. And we want to let them know that we stand with them where, wherever they go. So we would purify the land, we would lit it up, we would, uh, we would bless it with water rice, and then the children, our teens would prepare for months with ceremonial gongs and with torches in hand. They come in pairs into the meditation park. And the, the um, and they would, uh, they would among the platform in the middle and all the uh, family and friends and uh, who have uh, parents would surround them with light in hand and we will take pledge to them and say that we are your foundation we stand by you and we will support you and the teens with torch in hand would say that we respect you we'll work hard and we'll realize our potential and we will bring the light to the future the um right and so as you can see that the abandoned land can be transformed to the land of beauty and the beautiful place can be transformed into a sanctified place where we will be all nurtured by
by the support uh, from uh, and love from each other. And that was when I also realized what kind of artist I am. Our society would like to put artists on pedestal and the bigger light it is, the more recognition and the more um, the more value um, in the artwork, the brighter the, bli uh, the, the, the light. And I wanted to be a different kind of artist. And I had the pleasure to listen to the calling of li life, life's calling to me through the little voice within me. And I mustered all the courage I have and I followed the step and that voice let me into my personal journey life has prepared for me. I sense the wonder, I sense the challenge, I sense tremendous growth and deep gratification. And I said, that felt so good. I would like to be the pilot light that can light up the dormant creative light and light of kindness, I believe, lay deep in each one of us so that we can shine together. And only through that, we would have the power to expel the darkness, the greed, the dis insatiable design for profit that so so um so sickened our world uh and uh, our our world and our people today and that is the uh that's when uh i think after the at the village for 18 years Village became a wonderful organization, and it is st it still exists today with the younger, um, a vital and imaginative and talented um, a, a new team and the director. So if you visit Philadelphia, do visit them. They're just wonderful. But I felt that I wanted to be at the front line. So I left and created uh, another organization called the Barefoot Artists. It modeled after the Barefoot, uh, Barefoot Doctor in China. So modest and humble. It's just the art, uh, the, the the Barefoot Art, uh, the doctor who has a little medical um, kit and would just go to remote places where people people don't get medical care and open up the little box and then do whatever this person can. When, when the work is done and close the box and move on, I said, that is a good model for me. And so I formed the Barefoot Artist. And if you look at the, um, uh, the logo and it speaks of our mission, which is there's the world, create, bring beauty in, in broken places in the world. So simple. And so uh, one of the projects I did, this was when I, when I started Kenya, uh, it's almost a 20 year really, uh, is it? Uh, I first started in 1994. Uh, so while I was still at the village, but continued on for almost um, two decades. Anyway, I, have, um, I had the opportunity to visit this place and called the Coral Cultural. If, uh, if you look from afar, oh, romantic place. There's the lake, there's the hill, and there's the smoke rising. But if we get closer, it's a terrifying place and image. It's a dead lake, probably used to be a quarry, and then it is full of, um, full of garbage. And then um, the smoke rising where the, <clears throat> The smoke rising, um, right. Well, sorry. Um, so you saw the. I don't. I don't know why my. Wait a minute. Anyway. Um,
So you saw the images very quickly flip, uh, flipped on. Then I realized um, it's a dump site and 60% of our Nairobi's live in that situation. I think, I don't know exactly percent, but it makes one cry when you think of the tremendous wealth um, centered in so few people's hands and vast majority live in places like the garbage dump in Nair outside of Nairobi and not just in Kenya it's all over the world and um, um, and I, I couldn't when I first it, it took me almost five um, I don't know how many times I visit and um, to have the courage finally to follow my cho the children in my workshop into their playground which is in the dump site. The first time I went in I had boots on and I was even walking gingerly and I said yeah, the hospital dump and uh, bones and flies and plastic, anything you think about it, it's there. And I said, oh, this, and I saw two little children um, following me from my workshop and they had no shoes. And I, I told my um, assistant and I said, they have no shoes. This is so dangerous. We must get shoes for them. And then he, he just smiled and I looked, I turned around and there were 20 children, none of them have shoes. It just kind of shattering um, the inequality, the devastation, um, the, you know, the, so anyway, um, so I had a good fortune to meet Father Alex Zanotelli. He's an Italian priest. He came to help and he didn't help the poor from living outside. He inserted himself into the community, live as the poor, follow the step of Jesus Christ and be baptized by poverty itself. The poor tore people asunder and apart and there he get he received the blessings i was so moved by his strength and so i fo followed his footstep and he established a church and this is the only place that has uh, has war as you can see all their houses were assembled um uh, recycled materials from the from the dump site and so I said, okay, let's paint the paint angels. So that's before and after. And this is the, uh, the back of the church. Um, and um, yeah, right. This is the back of the church, uh, the transformation. Actually, this was the first, um, I started here. And no one, when I started, uh, I didn't, I could not have imagined, nobody, including myself, have imagined that beauty could exist in such a dump hole. But it was the only thing I know what to do is to bring paint and paint bright colors. So I stepped on and then while I was painting uh, and I turned around, it was almost like a performance art. Look at the amazement of the children. And then when they saw the bright color, it's not just I'm painting a flower, I'm painting the sun, I'm painting whatever. It, they, when I put the bright yellow, it's the sun rising. When I paint oh, blue, it's this ocean present. When I paint green, it is the tree of life growing. So I realized the power of the color, the energy in the power. Um, so this tiny little yard had 800 true children using it and i was so frightened because when you breathe here sometimes the gust wind from the bow of the lake would just blow everything to your face and then but this is where people live and i said we must have the presence of the angel here to protect them. That's why I painted the mother, uh, mama angel and the guardian angel. I 
and not to, uh, I mean, and it's, it's um, uh, appropriate for church, um, for Father Alex. Uh, yeah, okay. And so I always loved the Tang Dynasty tomb figurines. I had the dream to realize this, um, this vision. So I collaborated with Maui, the Kenyan sculptor Maui. And then we sculpted a series of figurines. Um, all angels. As I was looking for a home, and I found at the end of the church, the end of the slope, and here the over the fence is the huge um, garbage dump, and on the left here the platform. This is where they burn um, burn trash, and on your right is where the uh, latrine. And so, and there were spikes rising from this abandoned um, concrete slab. And I said, this is the home of our angel. The angel needs to live with the people and be there to comfort and then to, uh, to console and not in, uh, yeah, right. You can see how vast is the uh, garbage dump. And this is uh, where the angel, when they burn trash, of Korokocho, they became the incense for the angels. It's all fit there. So um, as we, uh, wh when we were painting the, um, it, 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 when the community saw the murals were transformed one after the other, they were getting become more and more excited. They were rehearsing songs and dances. And when they, they saw the angels being installed, we can felt their joy and hope palpable. And when we have the dedication, it was always a thousand people festival and the community come together and uh, celebrate. And my host, it's a, a gallery, um, international gal ga gallery, Payapa um, Art Gallery. So we invited the guests from outside, um, the, uh, from embassies, German embassies, um, um, uh, German, um, uh, Swiss, and uh, Italian, and, uh, um, and so forth. And of course, American embassy and people celebrate. And that morning, Yes, that morning we got the word. American ambassador Brazil herself came um, to mingle with the people and she gave a short speech in Swahili. It just brought so much joy and you see Father Alex on the right. And then, um, so children were singing and Father Alex said that it is so important, even when we couldn't do things, we, uh, we witness the suffering of the people. And uh, so they were saying something so angelic. And they say, um, I said, what were they singing? And they say that we welcome you, we welcome you, our honored guest. But please, when you leave us, do remember us and come back again. And uh, I re and that was the time I also experienced the power of art in uh, when we work together, when we transform, uh, uh, we take action to transform our environment through our imagination. Art has the power to push open the heavy hell gate and let light, sunlight in to illuminate the darkness. The sunlight are the people from outside who never st took step into this place of deprivation and, uh, and, uh, and uh, despair and brought resources, brought empathy, brought understanding and collaboration. And um, uh, so I continue to I'll go back for almost two decades. And the best thing was um, about five years ago on Facebook, I got the message from a young man, dear Mama Lily, that's what they call me in, in, in Nairobi, dear Mama Lily in Kokocho. And uh, 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 when I saw you doing the uh, uh, St. John's uh, mural transformation. I was very moved, but I was a little boy then. 
but now I am a grown young man and I organized several of uh, my friends. We, uh, we created an organization called the Talking Wall. You can check it online. And that was about five years ago. They already painted on the wall, even too broken for me. They would splash it with the community participation with colors and pattern and positive messages. They already did, uh, did about 1.5 um, a kilometer. I'm sorry, the picture is not so good, but the but here, um, what? Uh, so they, their collaboration brought um, uh, brought their collaboration brought uh, hope and uh, continued um, uh, the power of transformation through art. That was uh, Corocultural Nairobi. And so the creative power and light continue on, even though I have not visited the uh, community since 2007. That was the last time I vis visited there, but it continues on. The light continues to spread. And then uh, in 2004, I visited uh, Rwanda. And uh, that was a transformative project, project uh, not only for me personally, but for the community, for so many people. So I, we worked with the survivors village and I had the, um, the opportunity and the amazing opportunity and privilege to be able to build a genocide memorial uh, in uh, Rugerero. There's a short film, uh, film clip. If we have time, I can share that with you. But today what I want to share is a transformation of a totally destitute community that you never have heard their name ever mentioned when we talk about Rwanda. And when we talk about Rwanda, we think about genocide. Um, the Tutsi uh, was a Tutsi group and moderate Hutu were the uh, victims and the militant Hutu, they were the one killed uh, 100,000 of their countrymen within three months time. And the most effective and destructive genocide in our modern history. You never have heard of Twa, T-W-A. Twa, Twa people. Actually, those are the Twa people. They were actually the, uh, the original um, inhabitants of Central, um, Central Africa. They were the forest dwellers. And in the in Congo, in, in the jungle of uh, in uh, Kenya, Rwanda, in all that uh, uh, area. And today, through uh, generations of persecution, appropriation of the, the land, the right, and whatever. And today they only occupy 1% of Rwandan population. And so how did I come to know them? Because I noticed them in the market. I noticed a young boy, he would come in, whether uh, every day wearing the same uh, wearing the same clothes half of this is was hidden in the hood day after day after day so i got curious and i finally followed him visited the village and eventually understood the pain and generations of suffering of the twa people they're the what they call the forest the, the, the they're small um, small, what do you call that word? Small, they're small, you know. So anyway, um, because all, um, all resources were denied to them, so they went into the soil, they became potters. But look at the way they fire their pots. Their pots are wonderful, but they only have, they don't have money to buy wood and they can only gather leaves, bamboo leaves or banana leaves and to fire, um, fire their, uh, their pots. 
and they live in houses they built with their own hands. Here is a grandmother, and this is his living room, his storage, his kitchen, his um, uh, bedroom, and so forth. It's everything. The poverty is just devastating. But look at her, full of dignity, full of strength. He worked so, she worked so hard in order to put her grandson through college who had graduated with degree is doing very well and those are the people that has has so jean bosco on the left lower right uh, lower corner if if the our, my project in rwanda which was just um, it, it's not I say it, it just it's continue on we have adopted more villages we are continue to work with them transform villages so it the success is because of Jean Bosco he used to be a, a former Red uh, Red Cross regional director he understand community building he understand what to bring to the community at the right time so Anyway, the first thing we did is that we have to listen to the community to understand their need. So we have a community meeting, everybody, old and young, male and female, everybody came. Okay, so, uh, and right, many, many children. So we visited them. We have a big community and we figure out what their potters and what will be wonderful thing for them to do that can sell money and so they begin to have resources but they often they have one meal a day that's good of sometimes they have no meal a day so i said there must be a way to put some some resources some money in there so their children don't suffer hunger so i was thinking of goats and then I, um, so one of our team uh, said that, uh, they, so he said that, you want to give them gold? No, no, don't do such a thing. You don't give those, those people who don't think of tomorrow, they don't even remember their own history. And that's the word. So I said, he said that they will just um, kill the goats and cook it and drink and dance all night and call it a day which was true they don't think of tomorrow because for generations there was no tomorrow for them and uh, so um, jean bosco he was just so brilliant he thought long and hard he figured out uh, out the way this village has of 38 families so we divided the fa the, the, the family in, into two groups and half of the group they got all each family has a female goat and we have a male goat six months later they can't sell the goat they cannot eat the goat and six months later then they all give birth to little goats and the other half would have the goats. Here is the goat sharing. And so now you can see there's the little goats running around um, everywhere uh, in, the, so, um, in the village. And so when they're the best dancer because they have nothing so little. So when they have anything to celebrate, they break out into dancing and singing. Now you have a lot of goats the little goats are like a little bank account so when you need money children go to school you just sell a uh, sell goat and then we have a community meeting and i said how can we grow the resources and so from what uh, from their our community meeting and i say something for the community and not for individual families and they say they need an exhibition space so that they can display their wear, wares in better light and uh, sell for better price. So this is for generation landless. We bought the first piece of land for them to go to to or to work for their community building. 
uh, exhibition hall. And they said, please don't hire other people like usually the nonprofit groups. And so um, please hire us. So I said, okay, you're all hired. And when do we start? Next day. So next day we all came all the women with their baby. This is volcanic soil, very difficult to level. And they all came with smile and even little children. This is not child labor. This is a child imitating the parents and, and adults wanting to make a contribution to their community. So we, again, we have community meeting. Now, how do we design? What kind of uh, building do you want? And so even the class structure, the inequality exists in the most oppressed community. Here, women, a woman raised her hand and this man here shoot her down and say, because he as a man has the right to speak first. So I gave him a little lesson. I said, you don't do that in Mama Lily's workshop. You raise your hand and wait for your turn. So that was what it was about. <clears throat> and so when we asked them to design, again, Jean Bosco suggested we separate them. Women as one group, and uh, children as one group and men as a different group. Now look at children, their ecstatic expression. Children has no position. They are the lowest. Nobody ever listened to them. Here, Mama Lily invited them to express their dream and look at what they come up with wonderful it's a compound they have heard the adults discussion they understand they participate they wanted the compound a storage space a exhibition space a community uh, no working space and also a latrine and the shower space so they can be clean and presentable and be proud and of course, our man group had their three-dimensional and so ecstatic. And this is Mama Lily's contribution. And we, so um, I thought how to make this, um, this, um, uh, 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 this thing special. So I brought uh, the tiles and they, nobody have seen that. So we just gathered, we, uh, we, we bought the broken tiles and then um, anyone who I taught them the tile technique and anyone who wants to, yes. And at the time convenient to them can participate. Adults, children, young, look at the concentration, look at the uh, fascination. And I did the workshop, they did fly, uh, they paint. They painted, then I brought, I said, I pointed to them, uh, what goes on the wall. They are painting their own store, their own pots, the flowers they created in their workshop. And if you talk about rooting in community, honoring community creativity, and it's just on every level we're doing that. And then there's this one wall, nice. I said, it needs a nice mural. And what to, uh, what, to, what to paint? Since they are such wonderful dancers. And I said, why don't we paint you? So I get them to pose for me. And then I painted them. And then I have different sketches. And then I share it with them. And they tell me which one they like. And then it just happened. Yeah. So they chose one they like. And it just happened, you know, in this lowly place in the forgotten community, the, the, a, a poverty stricken community. Lo and behold, we are now being desired. We became desirable. Uh, University of Florida, their art and health center, new 
we collaborate in Ruwa, uh, I mean, in, uh, um, in, uh, at the village. So they came to us so their students can participate in community building, can bring their, um, their medicine knowledge, setting up program, medical program, and, uh, and so forth here. And so we got 18 volunteers from University of Florida. So old and young and, um, and local and uh, international guests all work together painting this mural. It's when, right. So, <clears throat> and at the end, when, uh, at the be be beginning, I only designed the dancers. Then a, um, a sculptor came and he said, Mama Lily, um, you don't have, um, but we cannot dance because there's no rhythm. So uh, you need to paint the drum. So I just gave him the brush and the color. I said, go and paint the drum. So it's a collective, totally a collective uh, process. It's owned, created by everyone and owned by the community, right? Um, is it perfect? Far from it. But it's authentic and unique. It caught the eye of people who would stop by, who would stop by. And, uh, um, and two members from American Embassy was curious. And once they visit them, then they were helping them to sell their wares in Kigali, uh, I mean, uh, yes, Kigali, the capital. So now this is the way they fire uh, their pots. They would stack it all up, big and small. And now as a, a, a communal effort, they are able to buy, they can afford to buy wood and that's have higher quality and more beautiful. Right. And they make animals and their animals get bigger and bigger. And this is the first time I met Mucho and his family. And this is all the wear. I bought up all the wear, all fit in a little box. This is the first time. And now one day I walk, I, 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 I met him on the road and his gorilla is almost half of it bigger than his size. He was so proud and carry it to town to sell it. And he said, Mama, Mama Lily, I am so happy now. Look at me. I look smart. I feel good and I have hope. And, uh, and now many of them build their own houses on the land we bought for them. Look at their pots getting bigger and more. And people, because they have a place, people come with car, with a motorcycle and buy their pots. And I also, we got land for them so that they don't have to hire labor out so that they can have harvest. Yeah. And the government, Yes, then government finally heard of them, commissioned them to make energy saving one stick stove. And so now it's steady uh, commission. And then that means steady income. And we always, every time we, I visited them, we always um, have, um, uh, we always have, um, uh, festivals and they are wonderful dancers so with the help of um, uh, University of Florida we got beautiful costume for them and then we turn their social dance into performance art she sang like a diva and then we celebrate their tradition hunting culture drumming and we took them to perform to an international conference. First time, many of them, um, first time out of their village, three hours from their uh, their village. And so now they have another um, way to make make money to uh, to earn money. And finally, two years ago, I think two or three years ago, the president and Buffett, Howard Buffett 
built this very impressive big building uh, at the border of Gang Kango. They need decorations. And then so they personally went to their workshop and they bought a lot of the pots and the animals. Look at the gorillas. Just so fantastic. Yeah, and to decorate their compound. They sold a lot because that was the year of, um, uh, of election. So many, many places decorate their buildings. And so um, now it is a community with confidence, with courage, with strength, with creativity, and with an attitude that they can. So I think it's already taken a long time. So I will not be, be able to share the short film about um, the Rwanda, uh, the building of the genocide memorial and the commemoration. But it's in the film, The Barefoot Artist, that is available in uh, uh, Prime Video, in Netflix and so forth. So I'm sorry it took so long <laughs> to explain everything. Thank you so much, Ms. Lily. It was a yeah. great, excellent presentation. So passionate, so beautiful. I saw the chat and people were just saying, oh, beautiful, impressive, and I really felt the same. Thank you so much. You. Um, if people, the participants have questions, please put them in the chat box and I will ask Ms. Lily to answer. I, I can say stop, share. Yeah, right, okay, great. I see tons of thank you so much to you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Someone asked, what is your next project? Oh, I am actually uh, doing a very big project in, um, uh, in Beijing at a school called Dandelion uh, School, Dandelion Middle School. I actually uh, worked on this project for five years uh, from 2005 to, uh, 2005 to 2010. And it's a um, very poor school on the outskirts of Beijing, transform, uh, trans help the school transform from an abandoned old factory into a functional, into a really, um, uh, really uh, very, um, how do you say, uh, very lovely, beautiful, art-filled nurturing environment. And, uh, and because the school, the sole purpose then was for um, the um, children of migrant workers. They were the lowest of the social strata. They had no opportunity to go to um, middle school after um, a primary school. And so, um, so I went and uh, helped to transform the uh, whole school. But now their old school was demolished because of the, um, you know, because of the city, uh, re uh, how the ex city planning, the rebuilding. And you know, the biggest international and the most beautiful and fabulous international airport was just in that region. So the whole region is transformed. And then they have a very nice school, you know, it's very formal and concrete, big glasses and everything. But um, students really feel homesick for the old school, art field, and they feel it's frozen, it's um, kind of impersonal, it's, um, 
there's no not warmth even though air in all physical condition it's i don't know you know 50, 50 times better and so the the principal invited me back again and uh, so i was thinking what would make sense to bring art to make it connected to chinese culture because the building is totally postmodernistic style how can you feel personal in this very grand impersonal environment how what that is a chain what is a chinese how do you connect to your roots of thousands of years and yet in this um, digital age when everything is moving so fast and how do you anchor and find the center when everything is flying away and expanding um, endlessly how do you find that personal voice and that care and that empathy and the heart that's what we need for our soul to thrive and uh, so I called the project the Tree of Life Project. I see my work from the beginning when I studied the Chinese culture, Chinese painting, and uh, being struck by the beauty of the uh, dustless world. And, and to my total surprise, I found the transformation when I see the land of abandonment, the land of brokenness can be transformed into the land of enchantment. And I found that dustless world is right here present with us in everyday life, especially in broken places, because that's where, isn't it? Um, Cohen, Leonard Cohen, that's how light comes in. And so I said in this, the challenge for me is that how do you soften, how do you become personal, a sense of belonging in our, our urban, modern building, ever grander, bigger, and expensive and impersonal. How do we anchor ourselves and how do we live in that authenticity? I'm trying to figure that out. So I call my project um, Tree of Life Project and also um, comma, create uh, individually, create collective create, uh, creativity, individual creativity and collective creativity. I want people to create, whether they're expert, with skill, without skill, parents, children, art teacher, math teacher, and whoever on equal footing and tell their story step by step and find the language. First, individually, that's, their, their, that's a tree of their personal experience. That is tree of their inner voice, expression, finding expression. Then I want them to sing together, find voices, listen to each other, and find a way to beckon to each other, and find a way to create together to this huge tree of life that can be like the pine the ancient pine and cider, uh, I mean cypress, or like the red tree, 2,000 years old. And yet it's rooted, it belongs to the people and everybody can come in on equal footing, their individual voice. Each one of them must be heard with respect and must be cherished and yet able to create something so beautiful that can have the energy to transform our environment and crises, challenges, and be authentic and be true to our nature. That's the project I'm working on. <laughs> Sorry, so long-winded. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. Uh, there are two other questions. The first one is, how do you build trust with these communities that you work with? Uh, I think if you ask that question, it already implies there is not trust. Okay. And so I don't go that route. I don't think that way. Actually, um, at the beginning, the community, the adults, not only they didn't trust me, they laughed their teeth off uh, of our project. But don't let that um, the um, uh, uh, don't let that uh, deflect. Is that the word? The uh, um, the distract distract us. And the thing is finding why do you do it? Finding the reason I, I I went in community I did not try to solve the problem I didn't try to make people's life better I was lost I didn't I, I, I didn't know who I was I was trying to find meaning I was trying to find out who I am what was the original intention in art what was my passion I was the one in need and so when a person in need going into a community in need we are on equal footing we needed each other and when children came they were the one trusted and then I didn't think about how I was going to do something great here or whatever. No, I just want to make art here, something modest. I didn't know how. And who came to my assistant, Jojo, and also uh, children uh, and children. And when you channel children's energy into, um, into uh, cement, and less wire and transporting um, things, then it becomes construction. When children realize their effort helps to um, build their community, when they see the result, art, art is quite is effective, it's immediate. When they see that turn into something beautiful, something wonderful, and uh, that's a sense of accomplishment they feel confident so the sense of joy begin to ripple and when you don't do something for personal gain that's automatically people see it she is not going to rip us off and they begin to come when children trust that you earn the trust of the children then you will earn the trust of adults and do something that is not for personal gain, but for joy of creativity and explore together, finding, uh, solving problems together. And uh, that's how I gained the trust. I hope Thank you so much. Uh, our last question is, did you feel your art inspired those in the community to be more artistic as well? Did they uh, continue having art, community art in the communities? <clears throat> I imagine once they know, they, um, I think once they see the magic and trans, it's, it, it, trans, transformative power of art and the magic of art, then it makes one addictive. <laughs> it's like big man so when he left the drug he said and became passionate about art he said that well the only problem is that I left the drug and became addicted to art <laughs> so I don't know I, I don't even I mean it's not that important to me um, if people likes art they will continue just like um, Daniel uh, Onega in um, in the ghetto in the in Kurkocho. and just like a uh, big man just like other people um, in um, <coughs> um, in Kaohsiung you know, I mean other places they some of them will but that sense of wonder 
and that sense of we can come together and meet the challenge and collectively build something. And uh, I think that will manifest. By the way, I, um, I define art as creativity in thinking, methodology, implementation. For example, buying land, building houses, building the compound for, for the Ruguerero uh, uh, Trois. Ruguerero is a place, the Trois village at Ruguerero. Buying land is a way of creativity so that other things can happen, you know. Buying gold so they can live. It's the art of life, which is all inclusive. So maybe they don't go into art, they go into entrepreneurship. And that is the art of life. Most welcome, as long as it's benefit for, um, for the community. I do aim for um, shared prosperity. I try to set up the first um, micro lending program in the survivors village in, uh, in Uguerero, Rwanda. I try to set it up in that way that the, uh, the interest they get, the benefit they get from whatever their entrepreneurship part of it will go to, to take care of the vulnerable in the community. So shared prosperity. And the reason why I continue to have community meetings, community building and so forth, so to build a closer community tide so that emotionally they are connected and they will help each other and uh, um, to reach the shared prosperity goal. Thank you so much, Ms. Lili Ye. It was great hearing you, seeing your projects and hearing your voice, your inspirational voice. Thanks a lot. And I want to say to all the participants, thank you so much for being here with us. We will have a podcast interview with Ms. Lili Ye on Thursday. And when we have it published, we will share it with you. Thank you so much. Have a very good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.